Welcome back to my channel. I know that I've uploaded it twice before this, but uh, those were like other videos, not really the main function of the channel, which is this, the reviewing of the Japanese film. I've come again, I know. I was gone for like a year, and you know, the world kind of went crazy there for a bit, so I just was like, oh, it was... it's not me I wasn't working on things. It was, I just, they all sucked. So I deleted them all. Uh, I should probably stop doing that. Even if a video sucks, uh, maybe I should try to save it in editing or something. But uh, I say that as I record this a second time, so I'm really, really full of shit. I thought what I'd do for my big triumphant return is something I kind of did at the beginning of this channel, review more than one movie in one video. Wow, incredible, I know. I'm very lazy and I don't think good. So today we're going to be taking a look at the Duel Project, which is a pair of Duel films. <laughs> Comedy genius! Uh, one is directed by Ryuhei Kitamura, the other by Yukihiko Sutsumi. I am incredibly impressed that I was able to remember the other guy's name, because I'm a fan of Ryuhei Kitamura, so his name is in there. Other guy, though, this is, I actually, I think this is technically the second film of his I've seen. I want to talk about how these films came to exist and why they're called The Duel Project. Uh, basically, uh, Rie Kitamura and Yuki Gosatsumi had both submitted short films for this sort of like film jam thing. And after the screening, they were out drinking together along with a producer who was impressed by how quickly the two directors completed their uh, segments for the short film uh, compilation. And, uh... Hey, this is Editing Nathan coming in here to tell the actual story because I got it wrong in, in the recording of this video. But Ryu Kitamura was in a bar after uh, the Cine Asian Film Festival in Cologne. It had nothing to do with the Jam Film Project, which him and Yukihiko Satsumi had both worked on, but they had not met while working on that film. Yukihiko Satsumi saw Ryuhei Kitamura sitting alone at the bar drinking and joined him, and they began talking about um, Yukihiko Satsumi's film, Chinese Diner. Uh, Ryuhei Kitamura was like, dude, I like that film. It was sick. And he was like, oh, thanks a lot. I like your movies too. They're they're pretty they're pretty slick. They're pretty cool. And they began discussing perhaps maybe they should make a sequel to Chinese Diner, like both of them. They could both work on a project together. And that's when the producer, Shinya Kawai, was like, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. A sequel to Chinese Diner? Fucking cringe, boys. What if we made a fighting movie? That's how it's wor worded in the where I got this the article where I got this information from. So then he pitched the idea of the dual project and uh, that's that's the details of the story that I got wrong. There you go. Goodbye. I love you. Mwah, kisses. Presented them with sort of a, a challenge. Each would independently make their own movie in a week, featuring only two main characters and set in a single location with the stipulation that one of the main characters must die by the end of the film. Uh, thus began the dual project. A uh, funny little anecdote, uh, Ryuhei Kitamura actually didn't know if the project was going to happen because he had heard nothing about it from Yukihiko Tsutsumi after they had this uh, drunken conversation. Until one day he received a call where Yukihiko Tsutsumi told him, Hey, I finished my movie. Uh, it's pretty good. Better get to stepping. Uh, and I think <laughs> that's pretty funny. So, after a little more than a week for both of them, we got... 2LDK and Aragami. 2LDK is directed by Yukihiko Satsumi. Aragami is directed by Ryuhei Kitamura. Because these two films were sort of a contest, uh, at the actual screening of them, there was a ballot box where you could slip either ticket into to vote for the film you liked best. The results of who won that little thing will be revealed at the end of the review when I also say which of the two I liked better. Uh, and whoever the winner is uh, can come to my house and I will cook them dinner. Not that they'll ever watch this, so I don't have to hold up that end of the bargain. Oh, ba boom That's using the old brain there. So, let's begin with Ryuhei Kitamura's Aragami.
Origami begins pretty damn well. We get a interesting setup. Uh, two samurai wounded from battle, one more than the other, arrive at some sort of shrine before both collapsing. One awakens to be informed by a man who lives at the shrine that the other is dead. And his body is waiting in the other room. But the audience immediately notices that something is a bit off about this gentleman and the mysterious woman that also lives with him in the shrine. This whole beginning creates a very moody atmosphere. It's raining, there's thunder and lightning outside. Uh, the set, which is gorgeous, has these sort of light shafts coming down from the roof and they put like a water shimmer kind of thing over them. So it kind of adds this ethereal, almost dreamlike quality to, to the set, which looks fantastic. It's this big open room, almost like a stage. Like a, you can see this as like a stage production. Uh, there's bits of rope and, and cloth hanging from the roof. Uh, it's simple. There's it's mostly just a big open room, but the walls and, and roof are decorated in a way that keeps it visually interesting. And I imagine that the openness of the set probably helps with all the camera work that Rihei Kitamura does. And we, we are introduced to two characters, an unnamed samurai and this guy who lives at the shrine. Uh, and they sort of begin talking to each other. And they're pretty amicable. You know, they get along as they talk, they make jokes, they laugh with each other. <laughs> あの仏像も被告の神。不思議な顔してるが。あれは私が掘ったんじゃ。あなたが。うん。こんなところに住んでると時間だけはたっぷりあるからの。それはすごいな。神というよりは私自身を掘ってみたんじゃが。いとるか。そう言われると少し似てるかも。気を使わんでも <laughs> 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 Uh, they make small talk. I want to give particular praise to Takeo Osawa, who plays the nameless samurai. Uh, I'm just going to refer to the character by the actor's name, because he doesn't have a name, and I don't want to say the nameless samurai a hundred times. That'll make you look like a fucking idiot, and I don't need help doing that. His acting is, like, weirdly, like, natural, given the sort of heightened setting and premise of, of this film. Uh, he just reacts to things in a way that I find like really believable. Whenever he hears something wild or crazy or, or a little joke occurs, he he just he just, he either reacts with the amount of like, oh what the fuckness that I would expect of a human in this kind of scenario. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> At some point he does start kind of rolling with it, but I think the film sets up 
when he starts rolling with the weirdness of the film. Uh, and and as the two talk, he he comes off very charming and likable. You're immediately like, I like this guy. This guy's cool. One of the things I think the opening 25, 30-ish minutes of this film uh, does really well is sort of making you, sort of setting you to a false sense of security, but you're never like, you're never really completely relaxed because, I mean, the film is part of the dual project. It says at the beginning, so you know that some sort of duel is probably going to happen. So the whole time that you're kind of growing to like these two guys and their interactions with each other, you're also thinking, okay, when's the other shoe going to drop? At which point it does. これは その uh, and also, when the other shoe drops, some of my complaints of the film start. The beginning is paced pretty well. My only complaint, this is a complaint that gets way worse after the, uh, the, the film really begins, is that some parts of the movie, some elements and, and scenes of dialogue and, and explanations for things are like belabored way too much. They just, they talk about things like five lines of dialogue more than I want them to. Because the problem I have with this movie is that they'll be explaining something or talking about something, and I'll go, yeah, I get it. <笑>人だと思えば、鬼であったり、妖怪であったり、この世には理解を超えた不可思議なものたちが確かに存在する。俺もそいつらに教えられたんだ。自分が人間ではなく。and then they'll keep doing it for a minute, and I'll go, okay, you could have cut some of that. Oni da toka, yokai da toka, aragami da toka. What are you talking about? This world is not all that you can see. This world is not all that you can see. This world is not all that you can see. This world is not And neither of these films are very long. They're both like just over an hour. So I can't help but feel that a lot of the sort of lengthy dialogue scenes in this film are sort of padding. Uh, and because these films are kind of released together, I really wouldn't have a problem if either of them weren't, you know, an hour long because you could watch them together, making both films together a feature length thing. Our, our mysterious shrine dweller reveals that he is, in fact, some sort of uh, ancient creature, uh, an aragami, uh, uh, a god of death and battle. Uh, he's also Miyamoto Musashi, the, the samurai. <laughs> もはや誰も俺と互角に戦える人間はいなくなった。ちょっと待って。じゃあその天下に知れ渡った<笑><笑> And he reveals to our main character that he has consumed the flesh of his friend. And that has given him sort of a regenerative, regenerative power. And 
he needs uh, Takeo Osawa to murk his ass because he's just kind of tired of being alive. He's been around for a while and he's like, I can't sleep, I can't dream, I, I'm bored, I've killed so many dudes, I just kind of want to eh, end it. Uh, Takeo has a pretty reasonable response. Why, why do I got to do this? Just murk yourself. And he's like, I can't, idiot. <laughs> ところがな。この体はもう。これ以上年を取らん。俺は自然には死ねえのだ。だったらな。自分で腹かきって勝手に死ねばいいだろ。でも俺だろな。切腹か。切腹などいうものは。お前ら人間が。くだらん誇りだ
because it goes on too long, like a lot of the non-action scenes in this film. But it's the one case where I think it works in the film's benefit, because even uh, the Aragami kind of appears to nod off. He just closes his eyes because he's bored. He also, like, backseat games Osawa and selecting his weapons, and I think that's a pretty, I think it's a pretty good fit. They go for a couple bouts. It's not just like one fight scene from the time that they start fighting till the end. They they take a couple breaks to talk about things and and discuss the fighting that they're going to have to do. And every one of these scenes, I'm just thinking I'm like fucking Millhouse. When are we getting to the sword fight factory? I just... It's like the dialogue's not bad. That's the problem. It, it's drawn out in a way that I like find believable, but not enjoyable as a, as a viewing experience. And like, if the action wasn't so sick... Like, there's this moment, one of my favorite moments in the fight scene. Uh, they're doing their battle, it's like it's like their first one, and uh, the Aragami notes that Osawa's sword is like, a sh it's like shit, it's gonna break very soon. And then, in the clash, he like snaps the whole front of his sword off, and it goes like flying into the floor, and it's so fucking cool. Hey, hey. <laughs> It's so awesome, and then they fucking sit down and talk about it. I fed you your liver, that's why you're not dead when I stabbed you. Because you, you're regen, because you, you got big powers. Let me explain about a guy who went crazy and ate babies to get immortality. It's like, you could have just said, I fed you a liver, makes you regenerate. I don't need the story about this man who ate babies. Because it's not, because if the, if the story about the baby eating was him, was the Aragami, I'd be like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. We're learning about him. But we're not. It's just some other guy. I mean, maybe you could argue that it's learning about the Aragami because it's like, he, he experienced this because he's lived a long time. He saw the crazy king do it. But eh, that's a stretch. That's a bit of an ass pull that I'm not fucking here for. And there's a point partway in this movie where the sort of the action changes a bit. Our character learns something about himself, that he might be not quite 100% human himself. And the action at this part gets really crazy and frenetic and, and, and way more intense. They, they vary up their tactics in this, in this movie a lot, which is something I appreciate. It's not just like a sword fight. They use hand-to-hand -hand techniques. There's a part where uh, the Aragami is, it's when they're first fighting. He, he doesn't draw a sword. And there's a great moment where he like blocks the guy's sword with like his, his like the handle of his katana and like hits it down and like, he like shoulder checks him. It's cool. It's like, I'm like, oh, that was creative. That was inventive. That was, it was good choreography. And they use a lot of like kicks and stuff at some points. There's a part where Osawa like breaks a floorboard up and like pushes it at the guy and he sends it back and Osawa cuts through it. And then the Aragami is coming towards him through like the broken piece of wood. And it's like, yeah, it's sick. There's a part where the, the Aragami's using two swords, and it's it's such a cool detail, because earlier in the film, when I referenced the sword breaking, that's like a thing that's like focused on. But in this scene, they're fighting, and Osawa's got one sword, and the Aragami's got two, and at some point they're clashing, and he just hits that guy's sword out of his hand. But it's this up angle shot, and you just hear like a shing and a and the sword just flies at frame. <laughs> And it looks really cool. It's like, the fact that it's not focused on, that it just happens, because it's because the fight's moving so fast, 
it adds to, to how cool it feels. And that's one of the things I appreciate about Ryu Kitamura as a, as a director. A lot of his action scenes are definitely the rule of cool. Like, would anyone do any of these things in an actual sword fight? I don't fucking know. I'm not a sword fighter. But it looks cool. And I, that's part of the appeal of film, looking cool. And it's not like this movie sets itself self up to be, like, realistic. It's about death gods. And with the exception of the brief moments in the middle of the film where we get some exposition and some dialogue and this sort of repeating motif that only repeats twice to my disappointment of the two sharing a drink the first time they drink it's wine and he's like i've never heard of wine because he's japanese and he probably has never met anyone from france i mean japan was isolationist for a very long time so yeah he probably never saw wine but he drinks it and he's like wow this is interesting and cool and then he has vodka and he's like oh <laughs> it's pretty funny フランスという国のワインという酒じゃ。ブドウから作っておる。さあ。この酒はな。ロシアという国のウォッカという<笑><笑><笑> But my problem with that is that it's this thing that happens twice and never again. I would have preferred a lot of the exposition scenes get cut short and instead replaced with in between each bout, you do three drinks, you know, wine, vodka, whiskey, rye, something like that. And, and they have sort of, instead of revealing, I don't know, lore about the world. They just kind of have maybe a character moment between each other as they fight. Because they do kind of like each other, so I think if they played into that more, I'd have probably liked the downtime between action a bit. But overall, it's very good. It's a very fun watch, and at being an hour and about 15 minutes, it, it both breezes by and feels a little long. It, it's weird to say that about a film that's so short, but again, those dialogue scenes really bring the pacing down. But the action scenes more than make up for it. A lot of the action in this, I read, was sort of Rihi Kitamura testing things out and practicing for a film he was going to make, Azumi, which is even crazier on the sword fight levels. There's some camera work in that movie that's nuts. I'm probably going to have to review it at some point. In the screening, I watched, in the first screening, because I watched these movies both twice. In the first screening, I watched this one second, and the second time I watched the film, I watched it first. And both times, I felt the same about it. I was hoping that maybe on the second viewing, I would appreciate the dialogue scenes more, like maybe once the film was over and I'd gone back to the original, back to the beginning of it and watched it again, something would be recontextualized, but not really. I feel a lot of the dialogue scenes go on too long, and it's not needed. And I feel like it's probably padding because maybe Ryu Kimura was worried about making a film sub 60 minutes. But overall, I think that if you're a fan of action and a fan of sick samurai sword fights, I would recommend checking out Arakami and, and seeing what it's all about. And sort of as, a, as maybe a primer to Rie Kimura's other films like Izumi or Versus or Godzilla Final Wars. My favorite moment of the film is actually after the end, the climax, 
where the victor has appeared, we get a brief cameo by my fucking boy, Tak Sakaguchi, who is in Versus. And he's apparently had a change of opinion about the coolness of sunglasses. And it sort of sets up this further, we're gonna have another battle, but this time I've got guns. And it's like a shame that we never got more of these films, because I would have loved to see Tak Sakaguchi fight a samurai with guns. It could have got really dumb. Like a sword with laser sights. Dumb. That's a reference to Versus. 2LDK! Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's fucking get down to business about this god dang movie! <laughs> about Yuki Hidusutsumi. 2LDK is a lot more grounded of a premise and as it begins it's very relatable. The basic setup is that there are two actresses living in an apartment owned by their by their talent agency. Uh, both actresses are have auditioned for a role in a film and neither knows who's going to get it but they are both equally confident that they're going to get it, not the other. この時間マジで悲しすぎ。新婚なんてすごいバカっぽくなかった。あいつ茶髪にしてっけど結構年よ。まさか最終まで残ると思わなかったから。すごいじゃん。初めてでいきなり極上のヒロイン候補極上あ
And it, it kind of leads into why I think this film works as well as it does is because it sort of it does have a theme in my eyes. It, it has a theme that you know poor communication will fuck up your social relationships. Instead of bottling things up inside, maybe you should express them. Uh, maybe not quite in the ways that they do in their head, but they should externalize more of their thoughts before it builds up this resentment and then explodes, as the film is, I guess you can assume, does. The build-up towards the action is longer in this film than it is in Aragami, but it doesn't feel longer. Because all of the dialogue and all of the exposition is forward moving. Nothing is ever repeated or belabored too much, unless there's a reason for it to do so. It basically, it gives you information, and the minute, me at least as a viewer, is like, I get it, it moves on. It, it's really, really well paced. We move from dialogue to dialogue, learning things about our characters and, and their relationships with various people. The, on screen, there's only the two actresses, but they, they do call people on the phone there's um there's two characters that they sort of talk to that aren't they're all three kind of that aren't there but they do talk to on the phone and this sort of slow building this boiling pot of these two characters and their dislike for each other the animosity they feel to each other for what are initially incredibly petty reasons when it does finally explode there's a cathartic quality to it and the thing that I find interesting is the thing that like finally kicks them off into the duel is a character basically having a mental breakdown over guilt for something they've done. And it's like, man, maybe if they just talked, they they could have uh, this could have gone better for both of them. The action that results is not as choreographed or frantic as it is in Aragami. It's kind of slow and and grounded, like the rest of the film. It feels like two people who have never fought in their lives trying to kill each other. People who don't really know what you exactly do to kill another person trying to figure it out. And it gives the film a real visceral, almost unpleasant at times, quality. And I mean, these two girls, they get messed up. They get bruised, cuts, burns, as they fight throughout the apartment using a variety of different tactics against each other. Another thing I find kind of interesting about the film is that it's a back and forth with the combat. With Aragami, it felt like two people having like a constant struggle that was pretty even. But in this, it's very much one person does something the other person does another thing and it goes back and forth like that it, it, it almost this is the analogy i used in the first time i was doing this film it feels turn-based like this is your turn what are you going to do Ooh, spray me with the fire extinguisher all right your go what are you going to do y hit me with the toilet seat all right your go oh cleaning spray ouchie and it goes back and forth like that and I think the, the thing, another thing I like about this is that they put to use, good use, the environment they're in and some character details. Like um, Rana admits that she is allergic to tatami mats and then later 
uh, Nozomi grabs her face and rubs it into a into a tatami mat, giving her this like horrible rash. Um, and it's sort of like a Chekhov's gun. Each each element that's established in the early dialogue part of the film kind of gets played around with in the action scene. Uh, eventually leading to the climax where, you know, someone's got to die. And I really do like the ending to this film. It's very nihilistic, but in a way that feels appropriate for its story. It doesn't feel needlessly nihilistic, like, oh, well, I fucking guess. It's like, yeah, no, I felt like it was leading towards that. It's interesting to see the two ways that Ryuhei Kitamura and... Yukihiko Satsumi are completely different as directors. They have completely different intentions and ways about going to achieve their goals cinematically. Ryu Kitamura dialogue feels like it's completely um, utilitarian and it is just leading you towards the action and sometimes it labors a little too much. And then the action is, is what Ryuhei Kitamura wants to get to and what he excels at. Whereas Yukihiko Satsumi seems more concerned with the character personal aspects of of these these fights these duels and as much as i love Riki kimura i think this focus on character uh pushes his film over into being my favorite between the two there's just more for me to connect with and to talk about in 2ldk aragami is very simple two dudes fight one's a death god the other's a normal dude they fight because he, the death god wants to die and they fight in 2LDK, like I said, there I feel like there's a theme here about communication and about bottling things up. And that's expressed in combat, in, in action. And it feels almost weird calling these action scenes because they're not... I wouldn't say they're thrilling so much as they are... It, it, it almost feels like uh, sort of an abstraction of more, like, arguments, you know... Each of them has a point to make, and they're trying to argue each other's points. But instead of talking, they're they're fighting each other. Um, but even though I like 2LDK more, it's not a ton more than Aragami. I like them both, and I would gladly watch both of them again. And honestly, I'd recommend slapping these on as a double feature. Just load both up into a video player and just let them play through both in their entirety. Um, but I am going to have to give the Gaijin Reviews crown of idiocy to, to LDK for being uh, a slightly better film. Uh, the results of which uh, are agreed by a couple critics I've seen and also the actual voting. Although it should be noted that 2LDK only won by one vote at the screening, uh, which I feel is pretty fair. Um, but those that's the dual project, 2LDK and Aragami, both good films. I think one skirts closer to great while the other stays at good, but both well worth anyone's time. And I suggest you acquire them by any means necessary and give them a watch. That's it. That's the end of the review. Thank you everyone for coming to this review of these two films. Not a very long video, mostly just because these two films aren't very long, which is why it was easy to review them both as a pair. Uh, hopefully this streak of releasing videos relatively consistently continues. Um, after this, there's going to be another episode of the Untitled Gundam Show coming out, and then I'm not quite sure what I'm going to review next, but I guess you'll find out in the future. Uh, thank you for coming, thank you for watching, I hope to see you again, and... As always, until I see you next, try not to die. I'm actually gonna fill, I'm actually gonna cook ramen now. As you guys know, it's just slaughter. Oh shit. <laughs>